Welcome to One on One with Expert Flyer. I'm your host, Lisa Kaslan, and today I'm really excited to uh, introduce our guests from Focus Right. The conference actually just wrapped up, and we have an analyst uh, from the firm, Alice Jong, joining us, and she's going to give us uh, an update on all the trends to look out for this year. Thanks so much for joining, Alice. Sure, no problem. No problem. Good. So uh, for folks who don't really know too much about Focus Right and all the cool things that you do, can you give us a, a high level description of, of the show and, and the purpose of, of it? Yeah. So Focus Right, we are a travel specific market research company and we focus on anything related to travel distribution and technology. And so for the conference, the U.S. conference is our largest event where we kind of gather the biggest um, ideas and the biggest opinions in the travel industry put them on stage to share trends that are happening, things to watch out for. We cover all the segments in travel. Um, and so, yeah, it's a great opportunity for attendees to not only gain knowledge about what's happening in the travel industry, technology and innovation, but also build connection with, you know, the biggest minds that are in the space. Yeah, awesome. So uh, uh, there were a few highlights, uh, obviously, that came out of the show. We can't cover everything, but um, I'd like to talk about at least two or three of them, uh, one of which I know was um, the, the popularity uh, of tours and activities and, uh, you know, I guess a, a significant uptick in that space. So what can you tell us about what may be coming down the road in 2018? What, consumer, what can consumers maybe look forward to in that segment? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This is actually um, a big study that I worked on directly, so I'm quite passionate about this segment. Um, essentially, so much of tours and activity, so basically the things that you do once you're in the destination, right? Whether it's going on a walking tour or going to a cooking class or going scuba diving, a lot of that is still transacted offline. Travelers tend to book that very last minute and in destination. Um, and the biggest point of sale is them actually walking up to the ticket booth or into the shop and purchasing it in person. But there's been a big shift where this is all moving online now. So think about how hotels and airlines are now online. You can easily compare options, whether it's on a meta search site or like on an OTA like Expedia. That's starting to happen for tours and activities now. And mm -hmm. in the past, um, Biotour, they were the first ones that really did this in a big way. But in the recent years, there's many more startups that are doing this as well. So platforms like Get Your Guide and Newsman, they're aggregating all these activities that you can do and putting it online where you can easily research activities and then book them online. So a lot of what's happening is that so many of these activities tend to be these small mom and pop shops. But there's new technology platforms now that are being created that cater to these smaller players that allows them to basically digitize their inventory, right? And so once the supply is digitized, then the consumer can also book it digitized. And it's really caught a lot of momentum. And even the biggest, you know, travel players have seen that there's a lot of potential with tours and activities. So the first time we did a study related to activities was back in 2011 or so. So just over five years ago. And around that time, the biggest, you know, players, they were kind of like, eh, lukewarm about tours and activities. But mm -hmm. since then, players like Expedia, TripAdvisor, Airbnb, they've all looked, they're all looking to tours and activities and adding it into, you know, their online platform, booking.com as well. So it's going to be easier wow. for travelers to research online activities to do, compare what they want to do, and then book it directly online whether it's in destination, so they can do it on their mobile phone, rather than having to actually go to the ticket booth or go to the shop and inquire, they can find all that information online. So that's where it's moving, and that's why it's growing so quickly, because a good about 80% or so of the activities marketplace is still offline right now. Wow, so you can that see there's is fantastic, a lot. though. That yeah. is so exciting. So uh, it, not that you're recommending, uh, but do you, can you just throw out a couple of sites that, that folks may want to explore now that, that are trying to do this? Well, some of the biggest uh, sites are well-known uh, brands. Expedia has Expedia Local Expert now, and they've actually integrated that into their mobile platform as well. Um, Airbnb launched uh, experiences last year, so mm -hmm. more focused on that local experience. TripAdvisor, once they bought Viator, they started integrating bookable content onto TripAdvisor. So you can book directly those activities from TripAdvisor now. And then some of the other examples, and there's, there are different ones by region. So Viator was the biggest one, which is now um, owned by TripAdvisor. In mm -hmm. Europe, you have Get Your Guide, which is one of the larger platforms as well. Um, Musement is in Europe. And then over in Asia, there's Kluke, there's um, Be My Guest. 
So, you know, a lot of players are starting in their markets. In India, we have Make My Trip um, and uh, Clear Trip. So, you know, a lot is starting regionally. Mm -hmm. and so it's a lot of opportunity to grow, a lot of new players. So it's just very mm -hmm. exciting to see how they're all going to take this and keep growing every all the inventory. That's great. That's really, really cool. All right. So uh, there was some talk about uh, the impact of artificial intelligence and voice with, you know, Echo and, you know, all of these devices that now that we're incorporating in our home, which allows us to, to speak our requests. Yeah. So uh, obviously that's probably going to impact the search ability of folks um, and, and the travel industry. So tell me how that plays out. Sure. Um, popular consensus is this is still quite new, right? We're in our infancy with this. And many of the biggest online players, they are exploring possibilities and options. Um, they're looking at chat. They're looking at voice. They're looking to see how they combine a mix of, you know, AI chatbots with human um, interaction to find that right balance. Um, many of them are looking to it to see what they can do with customer service inquiries. So, you know, we have Expedia who has been experimenting with Facebook Messenger. Um, earlier this year, they rolled out a Facebook Messenger booking capability for Hotels.com. Um, Kayak has been looking at Alexa uh, capabilities mm -hmm. as well. So they're all dabbling and they're trying to see what the possibilities are. But so far, you know, the what we are hearing from them is it's still new. They're exploring in its early stages. Um, over in Asia, C-Trip, they've used uh, AI customer service chatbots to handle many of their air customer inquiries. Um, Make My Trip in India, they've also rolled out chat-based online bookings for their packaging business. So we see different players exploring different routes. Uh, but ultimately, you know, it's like finding that that right balance that makes things easier for the customer and more personalized for the customer, building mm -hmm. efficiency for the company. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, it's definitely early stages. And we see how, you know, that the popularity of tools like voice to your um, point, they're growing more popular among consumers in our everyday life, right? Mm -hmm. So we saw in our um, travel technology survey that in the US, you know, about half of online travelers now use some kind of voice assistant in their everyday life on mm -hmm. a fairly regular basis. Mm -hmm. So in terms of travel, though, it's still, you know, they're still exploring how that can be best used in the future. But definitely um, the companies are looking at opportunities, starting with customer service. That's been the most organic um, channel for now. And they're mm -hmm. still exploring more the role of it as you go further into the shopping and booking stages. Um, mm -hmm. if that will be a better fit. Does that pose any challenges for you as, as a researcher in terms of being able to, to track those types of searches? Well, in terms of how we do our studies, you know, we can still survey the respondents to understand how they're integrating these kind of technologies into their travel purchase behavior. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of, you know, of our studies is primary research where we survey um, consumers, ah. survey the operators to understand how they're using different technologies. Okay, yeah. so we we like to talk about loyalty a lot, obviously, because we're we're catering to frequent flyers, uh, and you know, obviously, over the past year, a lot of changes in in the airline uh, loyalty program space um, has caused you know a little a little bit of uh, you know unpleasant rumblings, shall we say, since we've moved from a dollar spent to a, a fly uh, a flown model, right? Uh, it was interesting because you know, as I uh, went through some of some of the highlights uh, of, of the show, um, some some consideration uh, was put forth, you know, regarding you know customers and and their membership to these loyalty programs doesn't necessarily mean they're so loyal, right? right. Um, and I, there was an interesting statistic uh, about Airbnb. I realized you know lodging versus uh, flight, but I'm sure it sort of follows through that mm -hmm. uh, Airbnb had the highest level of customer loyalty, but they don't even have a loyalty program. Right. right. <laughs> I thought that was really cool. So talk a little bit about that. What do you think is kind of coming down the pike in terms of maybe some, you know, modifications or reinvention in that space? With air specifically, well, for both air and um, hotels, in general, we're seeing that, well, as Douglas said in his um, presentation at the conference, Loyalty programs don't mean loyalty necessarily, right? And what we've seen in our studies is that loyalty programs aren't deal makers for the traveler either. Like mm -hmm. overall, they aren't making their final booking decision based on a loyalty program. And in fact, for air, we see that the majority of travelers, they belong to either multiple loyalty programs or none at all. So the share of 
travelers that belong to just one is you know it's in the minority. And further to that, we also find that they're willing to book with a uh, airline outside of their loyalty program if it means a better price route or schedule, right? So that's what's really driving those purchases. And then on top of that, you know, your loyalty, it also depends on your, your home base location, right? If you're based in Atlanta, Delta's probably yeah. going to be your jam, right? Um, so, so much of it is based on these things that aren't necessarily about loyalty. It's about the commodity and what's available and what's the most convenient and um, price sense, like, you know, available to you in terms of your price range. So what we're really finding with these loyalty programs is most of them are built on, you know, perks and price and things like that. So essentially these loyalty programs have somewhat become commoditized. They aren't necessarily about building loyalty in the sense where there's this um, deeper connection to your brand. So in terms of loyalty programs, you know, we're looking to see is who is going to be able to modify it to find a way to build a deeper relationship to the customer. And to your point about the Airbnb, you know, it's been fascinating how Airbnb has been able to build this brain affinity um, mm-hmm with its user base where people keep coming back and reusing. And again, you know, obviously variances between the product, right? Airlines, especially in the U.S., there's a set number of airlines you can fly on, right? And when there's the option of a $100 flight versus a $600 flight, (laughs) if the schedule's pretty close, you're probably going to go with the $100 flight, right? Rather than trying to get 500 extra points on your frequent flyer um, program. So... I think for loyalty, what we're looking for is really who's going to be able to find a way to differentiate their brand through some kind of deeper connection, not just by offering these perks. Because the loyalty programs and frequent flyer miles are no longer really differentiating brands, right? They Mm -hmm. all kind of offer similar things now. Mm -hmm. Um, So how is that a differentiator to create a stronger brand affinity? So that's definitely what we'll be keeping an eye on here at Focusrite. Okay. Any, any, and not to put you on the spot, but any any twinklings uh, as to what, you know, some of these airlines might be thinking of to build those deeper connections. That's not something that we can do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. All right. So if you had any parting words or, you know, anything that uh, folks should be getting excited about, whether it's, you know, technology oriented or, uh, you know, comfort oriented or anything kind of coming down the pipe that's on your radar now that people might, uh, might be interested in knowing before I let you go, what, what might, might that be? I think just in general, the travel industry and some of these online um, companies, they're constantly looking for innovation and ways to make travel looking easier and more efficient for the customer, trying to stay on top of the shifts in how we now interact with brands and how we communicate. Um, HomeAway gave an incredible presentation about just the changes in how we communicate and how we're connected through technology these days. And I'm happy to share that link with you just because it's got fascinating points in there, just about how our attention span has shortened so much. The fact that we're constantly connected to our phones. Yeah. There was some statistic where on average, we end up touching our cell phone screens like two and a half times per minute. You know, oh, wow. It's just crazy, right? And <laughs> how the interface of how we communicate now changes. Um, it's no longer just about reading something in print. Now there's visuals and um, we had Snapchat. They um, presented at our conference as well. And, mm. you know, the younger ages, especially, you know, they're used to this more visual um, way of communication. Mm-hmm. And it's just, you know, all the brands have to keep track of all these things to understand how to tailor their product and experience to the various different customers and understanding mm-hmm. how we are using technology in our everyday life and see how that translates to how we also search, shop, and buy travel. Yeah, it, it really is an interesting space to watch. Yeah, it's a lot of exciting things. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, Alice, thank you so much, and uh, we'll probably come back to you next year. Sure. Yeah. Uh, more to talk about. Yeah, Great. yeah. All right. Well, thanks again. Thank Take you, care. Lisa. Bye. Bye.